without further ado, we, we're going to have a very fascinating final 20, 30 minutes uh, of, of this evening. Thanks to Dan, Danny <laughs> Nellu. Um, and there may be some things that you are offered the chance to participate in uh, during this as well. So keep an open mind um, to that. So without further ado, please welcome to, the, to our great stage, Danny Nemu. <laughs> <laughs> Drugs in the Bible. <laughs> if you were to ask her if there were any drugs in the Bible, what would she say? No. Uh, None. <laughs> <laughs> I am the Reverend Danny Nemu. Uh, I'm a real reverend. I was ordained on the internet in 1990s. It cost me $15. Um, so this is proper legit. Uh, I'm also a Bible nut. Uh, so if any of you are into drugs, then patience, we're going to get there. But I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about the Bible. So... All right. Um, does anyone here... Does anybody here read uh, Hebrew? No. no, okay, I'll do it for you. That says, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. Right? Uh, that's the first line of Genesis, uh, and it's normally translated, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Um, that's what it looks like with the vowel points. So the vowel points were put in in the 10th century AD, right? So in Hebrew, it, doesn't, it only has one vowel. And you work out how you're going to pronounce the word according to the consonants and according to the context, right? Now, in English, if I was to say the word hat is hot, sorry, the word hat and the word hot, it would mean something different because I've changed the vowel. And if I was to say my hat is hot, it would mean something different to my hattie is a hottie because you would change the vowels. Um, so there are very many, there are lots of different traditions of pronunciation on this text. Uh, before these boring dudes set it straight in the 10th century. In the 13th century AD, the, the Ramban, who's one of the greatest sages of Jewish history, uh, he's not some obscure, crazy hippie, and he said this, he said that when the Bible was originally written, it was written in black fire on white fire, and, it's, and it was written without any spaces. And if you take out the spaces and you break up the words in a different way, then it reveals different secrets. And... There might be something in it, because that is an inscription from the 10th century BC. It's in Paleo-Hebrew, which was the original language of the Bible, and it doesn't have spaces. And in fact, many ancient languages were written without spaces, and it seems that that's the case for Hebrew. So he gives this example of how you might break it up differently. Uh, that first word, and the top one, says Breshit, and that is translated as in the beginning. If you take the last two letters of the first word, and you put them on the second word, the first word becomes barosh, yeah? So it's bereshit barosh, because the vowel changes, right? Barosh means in the head. And the second word becomes yitbara. So bereshit bara becomes barosh yitbara, and then Elohim. And yitbara becomes passive, right? And it means create, was created. In the head was created God. <laughs> or gods or powers because Elohim is also a very complicated name right? which is a really interesting way to start a book which has all kinds of experiences where one person sees writing that another person doesn't see or one person talks to an angel that another person doesn't see or one person is moved by a compulsion that just affects him or her uh, we might talk about this as a psychiatric experience we might talk about this as mystical experience, but it's, it's very much something which happens inside, in, inside the head of one person. One interesting way to start a book. And again, this is one of the greatest sages of Jewish history who says, this is how you can break up the first line differently. Now, you can also break up the second line differently. Uh, from et ha-shamayim et ha-aretz to at ha-shamayim et ha-aretz. You are heavens and you are earth. Right? Nice way to start a book. 
I remember once I was sitting under a tree, lying under a tree in Wales, it was an apple tree, I was on mushrooms and I was looking up at the sky, uh, I was looking at the edge of the tree and feeling how the air was trafficking with the tree and all the phytochemicals and the gases and the water moving between them and I could feel beneath me the earth and the roots going into the earth and the edge of that all becoming rather porous and me being part of that whole system as well, breathing in, breathing out like that tree. I was heaven and I was earth. And it was just delicious. And this is one of the things that psychedelics are really good at is um, uh, making the edges fuzzy. And one of the reasons that psychedelics are useful in, for example, therapy or insight is because if you look at something and then you look at it again, but the edges have changed, you can see it differently, right? A little bit like with the words. So, for example, I might think, uh, my wife is a nightmare. And then I take a great big dose of mushrooms, and the edges change, and it's like, actually, we're a nightmare. And then I can do something about it, you know. I might put another edge somewhere else, right? Um, uh, it looks like a psychedelic crowd tonight. Last night it was uh, a little bit more formal. Uh, let's talk about this. Um, so let's talk about frankincense. Uh, frankincense is from the Boswellia tree. Uh, it is 1,500 miles away from Palestine, where it was uh, used. Uh, it took six months to go through robber-infested deserts to get this thing from there to there, which is a long way to go for a posh smell. <laughs> and it's also, um, uh, it's been burned to, uh, in Canaan, it was burned to the Canaan, Canaanite god Baal, it was burned to the Babylonian god, it was burned to the Egyptian god Ra, like 6,000 6, years ago. This trade, frankincense is the original international commodity, the city of Petra was built on the wealth of it. And what is it? Well, <clears throat> chemically it's a GABA receptor agonist, it works on the GABA system, the same system that Valium works on diazepam. Uh, it works in a slightly in a very different way to the diazepam. Uh, it's absolutely delicious. GABA, your GABA cells are one of the cells in your brain, and they make up 40% of the cells in your brain. It's an inhibitory system. That means it calms you down, brings you down. And uh, every cell in your brain is either a GABAergic cell, working with a GABA neurotransmitter, or it is a, um, or it's next to one. So it's a, a very widespread uh, cell. Um, it's also a dopamine reuptake inhibitor, which is interesting. It increases the amount of dopamine in the synaptic cleft, which basically means there's more dopamine going on in your brain. And the dopamine system is involved in things like reward pathways, it's involved in language production, creativity, uh, which we're going to come back to in a moment. Uh, it's classed as an anxiolytic and antidepressant. I don't want us to, to get too wrapped up in these terms, which come from the lunatic asylums and the poor houses of history. Uh, what the um, Israelites used it for was prophecy, right? The, all of these things were used for prophecy. I'm not going to talk about the trip B3 Iron Channel because it's... Uh, well, I will say that it's connected to um, migraine with aura and epilepsy with aura. So before you have an epileptic fit, or before you have migraine, certain types of migraine, people will feel presences, they will see lights moving around, they'll feel terror, they'll feel uh, elation, they'll smell things, they'll have deja vu, they'll see into the future, they'll think they see into the future. All of these things are also found in the stories of the prophets um, in the Bible. All right, so there seems to be a connection, I believe, between that state and uh, the prophetic state. And uh, this stuff, frankincense, works particularly on that iron channel in the brain. Now, no one ever learned about drugs by listening to me talk about them. <laughs> However, <laughs> I've got some high-grade uh, frankincense. Uh, I'm going to pass it around. This is yellow frankincense. It was sponsored by uh, the frankincense store. And um, uh, that's about your dose, right? That's a big dose. So uh, the size of about two garden peas is the right amount. If you chew it up, it will get really chewy. This is a lovely chewing gum, and it works when you are. System. So please take one. You don't, have, you don't have to take one. I'm not going to push drugs on you. Um, <laughs> but, you know, pass it around and uh, send it around, please. Um, it will chew and keep, keep chewing it. It's lovely. Um, yeah, if you take like six, it might start to offend the flora in your in your belly. So be careful with that. Um, all right, next one. Um, <laughs> this frankincense is brought to you by the frankincense store in London. <laughs> um, yeah, frankincense is involved in language production. I can see it's working. Uh, myrrh, right? Um, so let's talk about myrrh. 
Uh, myrrh comes from the Komifora plant. It's, it's called nataf in Hebrew, which means prophecy, also means distill, which is an interesting thing. Prophecy is a kind of distilled wisdom of the moment. And uh, it, it, it also, like, like the grain or the, the tear of myrrh, which comes off the tree, is also the distilled uh, kind of power and juice of the tree as well. So Hebrew is a fantastic language, basically. Anyway, it's got loads of opioid receptor agonists in it, these um, sesquiterpenoids. Works on the same system as opium and heroin. And uh, don't worry, I've got some of that for you as well. Um, <laughs> uh, one of those has 10% the uh, pain-killing power of uh, morphine, for example. Myrrh was given to Christ on the cross, and he refused. So don't feel you have to do that. Um, if anyone's into cannabis um, pharmacology, you might recognize uh, some or all of these from different cannabis strains. Uh, LMSN is a really interesting one. They're all in myrrh. Myrrh is still used in tribal situations. Put it in wine, it's great. Um, don't have too much and make you go to sleep. Um, Safrol, eugenol, LMSN are chemically similar to MDMA and mescaline. Uh, remember LMSN, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Now, in modern pharmacology, uh, pharmacologists like to separate what they call the active ingredient from a, um, from a, uh, a tree or a plant or something like that. And that's not how things were done back in the day. What, what the Persian, Egyptian, uh, Israelite, Chinese, all of these kind of medical systems would mix different plants together and make them do things in synergy. And the synergies with this stuff is super, super interesting. So for example, if you combine frankincense and myrrh and leave it overnight, um, then the chemicals change. Um, and it produces more opioid receptor agonists, and it also becomes more powerful at treating cancer. I'm just uh, combining these uh, uh, myrrh and frankincense in the room now. Isn't that interesting? They knew about these. Edwin Shaman Priest knew this, knew about this like thousands and thousands of years ago. Um, these are the novel compounds which are produced if you mix these two things together. <laughs> Round two. Um, uh, the anointing oil is another really interesting synergy. It's called Shemen Hamishcha in Hebrew. Uh, this word Mishcha comes from the word Masha. Masha means to wipe or to paint. It's where we get the word massage. It's also get where we get the word Mashiach, which means Messiah. The Messiah is the anointed one. And back in the day, he wasn't that unhappy looking dude to into the wall in churches. He was an anointed king who was going to be a powerful king. Um, so the anointing, and these are the ingredients, we'll get to them in a second, did not take place like that. Uh, it is a case of an, a, a body massage, and that was how things were done in Egyptian uh, medicine as well. This is uh, what happens with the king. Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, David, in the midst of his brethren, and the spirit of Yahweh came upon David strongly from that day forward. So the anointing oil of Exodus 30 was specifically used to introduce a king to Yahweh, and the king, his job was to mediate between the king and the tribe, you know, the, or, or rather the god and the tribe, the tribal god. So the tribal god would give him commands, and he would give commands to his people. And the priests were also anointed with this oil, with a massage, and uh, their job was also to mediate between people and the tribal god. And what's it got in it? Right, so we've already talked about Kenebasem. Uh, uh, it translates as calamus in modern Bibles. Uh, it's not calamus, because that's a reed grass, and Kenebasem was used as, uh, to make clothes out of. And you know what we were using uh, to make clothes back in the day? That's it in Hebrew, that's the singular, can, uh, kanbos. Canvas, right? That's can never say that's in the plural. It means fragrant cane. I used to be fond of a fragrant caning myself. <laughs> so canvas sounds like canvas and sounds like cannabis because it's the same stuff, basically. Um, and it's translated like that from the this is uh, uh, the Mishnah, um, the, uh, the the Talmud. Uh, this is Herodotus. He visits the Scythians, who are a tribe. If anyone can read Greek, even if you can't, actually says cannabis as well. Um, so he, he, the Scythians were a next door tribe to the Israelites. Um, hemp grows in Scythia. The Thracians make garments of it which closely resemble linen. The Scythians make, uh, take some of this hemp seed, probably not seed, and creeping under the felt covering, so what they did was they pushed down the, the flaps of their tent to make a hot box. 
Um, <coughs> throw it on red hot stones. Immediately it smokes and gives out such a vapour as no Grecian vapour bath can exceed. The Smiths, delighted, shout for joy. <laughs> that was a Scythian funeral. <laughs> so we've got some vessels from the time. Uh, they have uh, cannabis and opium uh, residues in them. So uh, in uh, all of the places around uh, Judah had something called cannabis that seemed to be cannabis. Uh, Judah was a, on a major um, trade route between, or two major trade routes, in fact, between uh, the kind of spice route and then to Egypt. In Egypt, we've got archaeological evidence from Ramses II's mummy, which had hemp, uh, cannabis pollen on it. Also had coca leaves, which is completely crazy. No one's really worked out how that happened. Um, and in Judah, uh, the southern part of the uh, Israelite empire, they, there's this shrine called Tel Arad. Right. Um, recently, it was discovered that these stains on these two pillars, uh, they would they did drug analysis and found that one of them was frankincense and one of them was cannabis, and they all got really excited. Like, oh, there's cannabis in both. Yeah, no shit. But what's really interesting is a mixture of like cannabis and frankincense, right? And here's another interesting thing about this: there were two altars and there were two uh, stones, painted stones, at the back of this uh, temple. And it seems that back in the day, Yahweh had a wife. Her name was Asherah, because about 15 kilometers from Tel Arad, there's another temple which has an inscription which says to Yahweh and his wife. So uh, in the, the, the reforms around the 8th century BC, um, the, it looks like um, Yahweh lost his wife, you know, just like me. <laughs> so the, the, the combination of frankincense and cannabis is absolutely fascinating. The level of the, the dopamine, uh, dopamine receptor, right? Um, I think I'll go back one. Um, Cannabis, to cut a very long story short, cannabis increases the amount of dopamine squirting out of the end of a neuron. And uh, frankincense uh, inhibits the enzyme which reabsorbs that uh, dopamine on the other side. So basically what it means is the synapse, which is something in your brain, has extra dopamine going in and less dopamine coming out. So it massively, kind of double whammy of increased dopamine in the brain, right? Dopamine is connected to word production. Um, and a novel idea. Now, this room here it used to be, it was, it was a hot box before uh, when it was complete. And people would sit in a massive cloud of, of cannabis and frankincense. And uh, the idea that they went into their, it was called the dabir, right? That comes from the word davar, davar, which means word or sentence or, or uh, argument or paragraph or something like that. So this is all about word production and it's right in there in the word. And what did they do there? They went in there, they talked to angels. And they came out, this was for divination, so people would say, what do I do about my problem? A uh, priest goes into his smoke bath, comes out and says, that's what you've done. <laughs> uh, right, um, so let's go enzymes. I said I wouldn't talk about this too much. Uh, is anyone familiar with ayahuasca, how ayahuasca works? Right, oh, I'll, I'll assume that's a yes. Um, so ayahuasca has two um, plants in it normally. It has a vine, which contains enzyme inhibitors, and it has a, a leaf which contains DMT, right? There's actually more to this story than that, but I'm gonna tell you the, the less complex story. So DMT, if you smoke it, it will do marvelous things to your brain. If you eat it, it will do nothing because it will be broken down in your gut unless you inhibit your gut enzymes with the ayahuasca vine, right? And then it lets DMT get through the blood-brain barrier into your brain and you can meet God. So, that's one enzyme system. There's another enzyme system called the cytochrome system. It's got 51 members. Uh, five of them are involved in breaking down all of the drugs which you are likely to encounter in your life, right? Um, so that's one of them. Uh, LMS in, if you take it on its own, is a mild sedative. If you take it whilst inhibiting this particular enzyme, CYP3A4, it becomes like uh, mescaline. It becomes really, really strong because the body doesn't break it down, right? Um, and you can see that it's very similar, so <coughs> very similar to mescaline. So this is one of I said I'm going to talk about this. Uh, this is one of five uh, enzymes. Uh, four of them are inhibited by cinnamon, which is one of the ingredients of the anointing oil, and one of them is inhibited by cassia. So these are, which is another ingredient, cinnamon and verum and cinnamon cassia. They're two different types of cinnamon. Isn't that curious? So these guys were anointing themselves with this oil, and then that was the first. So, the, so when I, these guys, right? Uh, when a priest, when the priests went into the tabernacle, which we're going to talk about in a minute, they would have a massage with all this stuff, inhibit 
all of their enzymes, which would stop drugs getting into their brain, and then also cannabis, also myrrh. Oh, I forgot to give you a dose of myrrh. That was terribly rude of me. Right, your dose is probably around, you know those really fancy pieces of sugar? Like, can you see that? Like, about that much. Um, so a large piece of sugar or two, it won't hurt you. <laughs> won't hurt you. Um, I, I, I take it all the time, and I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... Uh, Danny, are you, are you good six minutes? Six minutes, let's see. Uh, yeah. um, yes, I will. Uh, so when these are inhibited, uh, then, uh, then drugs get a whole lot stronger, right? Um, the high priest, I will get through it in six minutes, the high priest, right, he would be smeared with incense, uh, with, this, uh, with this oil, inhibiting his enzymes, and then he would go into a four and a half meter cube chamber in the back of the tabernacle. Tabernacle is described over five chapters of the Bible. Um, to put that into context, the Tower of Babel gets half a chapter, so he gets five chapters. How many pegs there are, how close the pegs are together, what it's all made of, like it's really, really good description of some kit to make a hot box. And the only thing that happens <laughs> in the back of that tent, which has uh, a, a, a veil which is the thickness of a man's hand, uh, and it's totally sealed, and it's four and a half meter cube, is burning of uh, finely ground handfuls of incense. And this is what's in them. Um, so I'm going to uh, invite you to smear some of this on yourself. This is one of them. This is a spit <laughs> uh, Best way to do it is put some on your wrist, and then put it on your jugular vein. Uh, and then once you've done that, um, go ahead and get some murder. Why not? Um, I've also got some costas in a minute. Um, so these, I'm not, I haven't got time to go into the psychopharmacology of them, but it is in my book over there, the blue one. Uh, this one's interesting, Neptodini Pyrotechnica. That's not psychoactive. It's called Ma'ale uh, Ashan in Hebrew, which means that which causes smoke to rise. Right? When a sacrifice is given, when the smoke rises, it seems a good thing. So imagine the scene. In that hot box, uh, tons, tons and tons of, uh, uh, of resins are being burned. When the veil is, is, is drawn back, the smoke comes through the chamber and rises at the door like a pillar of smoke. Now, you will be familiar with the Bible where it talks about how the Israelites followed the pillar of smoke through the wilderness and it told them where to go. And I think this may be an example of a shaman priest of the Israelites being told where to go by the pillar of the smoke and everyone following the shaman priest, because that was his job, right? He would go, Aaron or Moses, would go into the back of his chamber and he'd have a think and he'd come out and go, right, let's attack them. Or let's not attack them, let's run away. Or this is where you find water. Or let's go over there, right? This is uh, the traditional job of Shaman to look after his tribe. Um, divination. Uh, the other priests would go, they wouldn't go into the chamber, the Holy of Holies, the Debir, but they would go and eat showbread. Now, we don't know what was in showbread except for it had frankincense in it, but we do know that it was given in tiny doses. Uh, every priest got only the size of a bean, and the delicate priest refused to take it all together. It once happened, one took his own share. And his fellows, he was nicknamed Robber till his death. No, this is the showbread. Uh, the, 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 the stuff might be a book, but this is the showbread. So it's another one of the drugs that's in the tabernacle that the Israelites are carrying through the, uh, the wilderness. Um, so it's, it's, it's described as showbread, but you get a tiny little dose of it. Quite a lot of them are like, no, I think I've had enough. Uh, one guy's like, I'm going to have yours as well. And he gets a nickname for the rest of his life. Right? I wonder if you have a friend who... Uh, frankincense picked up the name Drug Hoover Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens in the Talmud. Uh, right, um, you can't see that, but it says, and all the people saw the sound of the flames, uh, and all the people saw, uh, were seeing the sound of the flames and the sound of the trumpet, right? You don't normally see the sound of flames and the sound of the... You, know, you don't normally see... You don't normally see the sound of the trumpet, yeah. right? Um, this is the only example of synesthesia in the Bible. And it's also, that you might see the sound of a trumpet if you're tripping, right? Um, it's also the only example of a collective revelation. This is at the foot of the mountain where Moses is up there communing with God. And uh, all of the people have this synesthetic experience together. And what they're doing at this time, they're eating manna. 
Now, if I had time, I would explain to you why I believe that manna is ergot. Um, all of the rest of the things that I've said today are not speculative. It's like, it's pharmacology. You can look it up in journals. In fact, I published a journal article, which is peer-reviewed by the kind of people who do that. Uh, it's called Getting High with the Most High. Um, manna looks, uh, tastes, behaves, and is prepared just like you just like you prepare ergot for use. And ergot contains LSA, which is a cousin of LSD, and makes you have visions. Um, I wish I had time to explain why the whole story of Exodus is a metaphor for the psychedelic experience, leaving behind the shackles of your bondage, going through the. Uh, uh, the wilderness, not knowing where you're going, but like a vague idea that there's a promised land somewhere in the future. Um, a bit more to it than that. Um, so if you want to learn more about all of this, there are some books you can read. You can read Exodus. You can read Psalms. You can read The Song of Songs. Or you can read my book there, which is called Neuro Apocalypse. And that's it. Thank you very much. I'm just going to mention that this Frankincense is sponsored by uh, the Frankincense store. You get a 10% discount if you use the code NEMU when you buy some high grade. Uh, these are the other things I do. I've got the website called drugsinthebible.com. So you find out more about uh, that and all the various other things I do for them. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> do we have... Uh, do you have any questions? Uh, <laughs> yes. Just any uh, thoughts on those words from the Gospel of John in the beginning was the word that the word was with God and the word was God from your perspective. <laughs> How long we got? <laughs> oh man. Yes, uh, I, 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 yes, I, I've read the whole chapter on that. So um, what I'm going to say is. Um, what I'm going to say is this, right? Um, the Tao Te Ching begins by saying uh, the, the thing which can be named is not the thing. Yeah. And the Gospel of John begins with, in the beginning was the word. Yeah. And that's oh, right. really interesting, oh, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. To go into that, I mean, literally, I've got a chapter about that in there. One of the other chapters is a comparison of Japanese and English and how the different linguistics of different languages affect your brain and what you remember and what you see. So it goes all into how the word influences how we think. But to give you like a potted answer, the answer is, any thoughts on that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any thoughts you want to share on that? No, I was just, just interested in any more questions? Yeah. Do you have to ingest the frankincense or can you inhale it? I mean, uh, right, okay. <laughs> so it depends what you're doing with it. Um, the, yeah, so for, to, for treating depression, for example, uh, I, I, the best way to do it is, um, is inhaling it. And the best way to do that is once a week, at least once a week, but doing it in a kind of ritualized fashion, going about your house, getting it under the table, getting behind all the things, going around your brain, getting into all the places where, you know, it's kind of hidden, saying your prayers while you're doing it, right? Um, there's something a whole lot, there's something very ritualistic about that. Um, in terms of the pharmacology, um, yeah, if you've ever eaten cannabis or smoked cannabis, you'll know that there's a difference. So it does different stuff. Uh, depending on what you're doing. I would say try both. <laughs> Again, I've been talking about a lot about drugs. Bear in mind they are drugs, right? Um, so dosage is important. They won't, you, won't, you won't drive yourself insane by having too much frankincense. But if you have like about the, if you have more than about three or four garden pea signs, you might upset the, the, uh, the flora in your, in your pants. Um, um, no. And myrrh as well. I mean, do you know what? Because I, I actually went to the guy from Frankenstein's store and I said, do you reckon that's a, a right that dose of myrrh? He's like, no, what's that? He has loads. So I don't know what the uh, fatal dose of myrrh is. I haven't hit it yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gut flora. Gut flora, okay. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, work your way up to uh, mega doses. When, when do you take it? Do you, do you take it regularly or are there just there are times in your life or times in the day where you think, I just fancy a hit of... Um, 
Yeah. Uh, so traditionally, it was taken for divination, right? So here's a really good way to take it. If you have a question in your mind, um, go into the, your bathroom, have a bath, and hotbox your bathroom, right? Uh, burn tons of it, frankincense particularly, also myrrh is good. Um, and uh, you can mix it with other things as well if you want to. And, uh, and just close your eyes and see what images form behind your eyes. Because it will, that's how it was used traditionally. When do I take it personally? Um, <coughs> some, I mean, when I walk past it in my house, I'm like, oh, <laughs> a little bit of that won't do me any harm. Um, I give it to my children when they've got toothache, particularly, like Murr is a very good painkiller. Um, it's really good uh, for anxiety. Um, and anxiety is an interesting one, right? Um, there's an experiment done on rats where it's in a maze, and it's, one of these, it's an open maze, right? So it's, it's got areas which are open. And um, rats tend to like to kind of skit along the sides of things because their major predators are birds, which will kind of swoop down if they're not kind of covered. But if you give a rat frankincense, it will spend a whole lot more time kind of exploring the other areas, you know. So when we are suffering anxiety, and even if it's totally below, even if it's just normal levels, just like, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm alive and something might eat me because, you know, I'm, I'm, that's what the world's like. Um, we, we're always a little bit less open to new possibilities, which is why it's so good for divination, right? So if you can kind of chill out that, if you know you're in a safe place, and you chill out that bit of your mind, then all these ideas can start to think because we get exploring, uh, exploratory. So that's kind of, yeah, I use it a lot. Oh, I forgot to say, um, if anyone wants, and, uh, you know, this is uh, Costas, Sassaray Costas. Uh, in the Islamic tradition, uh, this is used as a medicine. It's um, it was Muhammad's favourite. Uh, uh, well, one of the hadiths says this is, is he recommends it as a medicine. First thing in the morning uh, to have a dose of this. Um, I found that snorting is quite good. So um, <laughs> it's said to chase the gin out of your body, and it's good for colds. But it's also I don't know. It'll burn a little bit. I'm going to warn you uh, up ahead. But if you fancy um, a little a little pinch. <laughs> then, um, then feel free. That's all right. Here, take it. Take it and pass it around. And uh, don't. I mean, listen. Sassarea costas. It's what's in jostics. It's used in Tibetan um, uh, tradition. It's used in uh, in a tea. But um, you know, I don't know of any scriptural tradition behind snorting costas. <laughs> It'll burn a little bit, so don't have too much. <laughs> Not burning. <coughs> nice, isn't it? Yeah. Any more questions? Yes. Thank you for that. It's very interesting. I'm totally going to get your book because I'm intrigued. Thank you. Uh, the only thing I've sort of heard along these lines before is it's quite widely, I've heard it a few times, is the idea of the, the burning bush, right? And Moses. That it was an acacia bush, and that that has had all the DMT, and that that might have explained <laughs> what he thought when he saw God. Um, what were your thoughts on that? That's a very good question. Thank you for it. Um, it does seem to be an acacia. That one. Uh, all of the stuff that I've been talking about today is the technologies which the priest used <coughs> to access these states. Right. Uh, so Moses at that point wasn't a priest. Moses was a prophet. And the prophet, there's no evidence at all that I've that I found that the prophets were using any kind of drugs at all. Um, there's tons of evidence that the others were using drugs because they smear it on and they, they burn it and they eat it. Um, and you get like, you get other lines like things like, um, I have perfumed my bed, our bed with um, aloes and myrrh. Come, let us take our feast of love until morning. Stuff like that. So there's lots of drug use in the Bible like for aphrodisiacs, whatever. But in terms of the prophets, they do stuff like they hold certain positions or they fast or they're sexually abstinent or they go to a special place. They do all the things that yogis do. Mm. But I think in that particular story, there's no, it doesn't seem to be that he's taken any drugs. And that's actually, I'm really glad you asked that question because uh, a lot of people look at the Bible and they say um, it's, it's all drug experience. And there are all kinds of ways of having mystical experiences, visions without drugs. And I think that was an example uh, of one, personally, I think. And it's a really interesting one. So a burning bush, uh, a, and it's described as a bush that burns but does not get consumed, right? That happens twice in the Bible, um, that particular description. 
it happens there. If you imagine the kind of geometric patterns that you see around an object when you're tripping, right? If you didn't have the language for it, that kind of flame thing going on around the thing. Mm -hmm. You also get it at that that um, uh, when Moses is on the mountain as well. Uh, there's also a description of a, it was a flame, but it wasn't consumed. So I think that's a, a potentially a very um, apt way of describing geometric uh, lights around the thing. So, so can I just clarify? So, so you, you you don't think that so so the standard sort of interpretation of that is that Moses that, that there was literally a bush that was on fire and that he that inhaled some DMT and thought he saw something. That's the way that I've sort of seen that explained before, but it always seemed a little bit far fetched. No, it's not. That, that's yeah, it's 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 not on fire because it says yeah. it burned with a flame that did not consume. But so you're also it, saying that you don't think that he actually took drugs and that it was a, that it was a metaphor either. I personally don't think so, no, because because in the, because he walks up to a bush and it's and he sees a burning bush, right? In other, you know, it, it's um, if it said, you know, he he ate something and then he saw this thing, I think, yeah, maybe. But you know, um, people have um, psychiatric, okay, people have psychedelic experiences. People have like mystical experiences and have always had mystical experiences. I think before the Enlightenment, we were having them left, right, and centre. You know, before we were told you know, behave yourself, behave normally. Um, so yeah, personally, I, I, yeah, I don't think it is. I think it's, I think it's a visionary experience. But that's what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's a flame that burns, doesn't consume. So it's not a fire. Yeah. yeah. And and also like, um, you know, to get to, to get, if you want to smoke DMT, you need to distill. If you if it was an acacia, you'd have to distill it a time. You can't get yeah, high exactly, from burning yeah. an acacia tree. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. There's something interesting about the word the the word acacia. In Hebrew, is um, uh, shittim. Oh yeah, that's right. So acacia is a thorned, uh, a thorned bush, right? Uh, ac the acacia, one of the acacias, is considered the the crown of Christ was made out of acacia thorns, and the thorn is something you also see it in that story, which I don't have time to go into of uh, the wilderness. Um, the thorn is something which penetrates from one zone into another zone and allows stuff to come through. So I think that there's a, uh, a kind of poetic, literary allusion to the fact of revelation from another zone leaking into this zone in the fact of the thorn in the acacia. And in fact, in um, like in the Yoruba tradition, for example, uh, Eshu, who's the gatekeeper of um, uh, his kind of message, a bit like Hermes, who kind of brings us stuff. He's also like thorned plants are sacred to him. So you often find you often you actually and you also find thorns at the edge, you know, black thorn at the edge of, of um, fields and stuff. So there's something about edges and thorns. I have one more question, if I may. Are you talking to me? Sorry, unless anyone else does. No, it's all right. Is that right? What came first for you, the drugs or the Bible? <laughs> 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 That's a very interesting question. Um, I was uh, staying at home. Um, thinking about what I should do my dissertation on at university, uh, stone. So I guess the drugs. <laughs> and the Jehovah's Witnesses arrived. And I was like, oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I got talking to them. Uh, and um, I did my dissertation on apocalyptic cults and their views on uh, the body, medicine, and sex. And uh, so... Obviously, I had to read Daniel, I had to read Matthew, I had to read the apocalyptic uh, books of the Bible. And I got to a bit in Matthew where it says, uh, the, at the end of the world, there'll be wailing and... Uh, what? Gnashing of teeth. Gnashing of teeth, yeah. Um, and, that will, and, and, I, and I looked at the, the original, which is in Greek, and the word world is actually aeon. It doesn't mean world, it means aeon. It means an epoch. Like or a period, yeah. and the translation of world was done by King James's scribes, and King James really didn't want the end of the aeon because he was the the king, and there were all these like ra uh, roundheads uh, wanting the Palmyrian aeon, or they wanted like a like a, a, a new age, <laughs> the coming of the age of Aquarius, but like roundhead style, uh, Puritan <laughs> style. Um, so throughout history, there have been revolutionaries who have wanted a new world, and it's there in Matthew. But when you talk about a new world or a new era, 
that's what it, that's what is in the text. But it's been translated at the end of the world, and like, no, what's the end of the world? That's, I mean, that's your real nutcase. Like, um, so I got into mistranslation, and the first talk I gave about the Bible was an anarchist conference. It was called Mistranslation in the Service of Empire, and I was looking at various different things. But uh, the Bible is a bit of a gateway drug. And once you start looking at the Hebrew, it's like, whoa, this is wild. It's a super psychedelic book. Like, the poetry in it is, is my, in Hebrew, like, it's quite boring when it's translated into English often. But the poetry, even, was it you that asked about, you know, the word? Uh, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. You know, that's just a contradiction right in the beginning. That's mind blowing poetry right in the beginning. It also means. Uh, uh, pros in, 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 in Greek, so uh, with God also means against God, and then you get into the whole question of like the serpent and the, against God, and you know, it gets really interesting just in the first couple of words. So uh, yeah, so <laughs> getting stoned and reading the Bible, which is what the uh, rappers are into. Um, yeah, go for it. <laughs> Tell me what you find.